In this video, we will show the installation and setup of EDB Failover Manager version 3.0. On this virtual machine, I already have EDB Postgres Advanced Server installed and running. Java has also been installed on this system. First, if a previous version of Failover Manager is running, we shut down the Failover Manager cluster. This does not affect the database servers. After setting up our repository configuration, we can install the Failover Manager package. See the user's guide for more information on installation. After installation, I'm adding the Failover Manager bin directory to my path to save typing. After installation is complete, we need to create a Properties and Nodes file for our cluster. The Properties file stores settings used by Failover Manager while running, and the Nodes file tells an agent how to find other nodes at startup. By convention, the file names match the cluster name that we will use. The default is EFM. If you do not have a 2.0 or 2.1 version of Failover Manager previously installed, you would copy the existing template files, change the ownership to EFM, and edit their values. The ownership change is needed due to the way Failover Manager 3 works with sudo. In this example, we will use the EFM upgrade comp utility to copy previous settings instead. We will go over the file contents after this step. From the output, we see there are some changes to the SSL and virtual IP related properties. The upgrade comp utility will calculate the correct values for 3.0. New properties were also added with their default values. The ownership of the properties and nodes files have been set correctly as well. We will look at a sample of the properties file next. In the failover manager properties file, values are not enclosed in quotes. Anytime a script path is specified, the script will be executed by the same user running Failover Manager. The first set of properties describe how the Failover Manager agent will connect to the local database. To create the encrypted password value, we use the EFM utility. We'll switch to another window to run the command for an example. The command is given the current cluster name, the password entered twice, and the text can be copied into the properties file. The next set of properties describe your database installation. This is the operating system user that owns the data directory. If you're running your database as a service, add the service name here so that Failover Manager can start and stop the database service as needed. Otherwise, add the PG bin directory and Failover Manager will use PGCTL instead. The recovery conf dir is the data directory that contains the recovery conf file for standby databases. On a master node, this is where the recovery conf file will be created if the user initiates a database switchover. The SSL mode property is used if using SSL for database connections. When any event happens in Failover Manager, the agent can send an email notification and or invoke a custom script instead. Only one of these properties is required, but both can be used. The bind address is the address and the port that are used for the agent to communicate with other Failover Manager agents. The admin port is the port on which the agent will listen for local instructions from the command line interface. This must be different from the port used with the bind address above. If this will be a witness node, setting is witness to true tells the agent not to look for a local database to monitor. This section describes how long the agent will wait before declaring a database failure. In this case, which matches the default, the agent will ping the database every 10 seconds. If a successful response has not occurred for more than 60 seconds, a final check is made. The final timeout is how long the agent will wait if the attempt is hanging for some reason rather than succeeding or failing immediately. The remote timeout defines how long an agent will wait while checking a remote database if needed. This is used, for instance, after an agent declares a database failure and asks the other agents for confirmation. This property defines how long agents will wait before declaring that another node has failed or become isolated. The stop isolated master property is new in Failover Manager 3.0. This can be used to have a failover manager agent stop the master database if its node becomes isolated from the majority of the cluster. This helps prevent applications from accidentally writing to it if it is reconnected to the network while still running. The next two properties describe an address and a ping command that are used by the agents to detect network connectivity. The auto allow hosts property makes starting a cluster easier when you already know the addresses of the members that are going to be in the cluster. The default value is false. The connection count property defines how many times the connection will be used to test the local database before a new connection is created. The default value is zero, meaning that a new connection will always be created. You can set this property to false to turn off automatic failover and receive notifications instead when there is a failover event. 
If the cluster contains more than one standby, after a master failover, the remaining standbys will be reconfigured to point to the new master. The default value for this property is true. Set to false to turn off the reconfiguration. The promotable property defines whether or not a standby database can be promoted to master. The default value is true. The minimum standbys property defines the minimum number of standbys that will be kept in a cluster at all times. The default is zero. Failover Manager will not perform a failover if promoting a standby will drop the number of standbys below this value. The recovery check period is how often an agent checks for a database to come out of recovery during a promotion. The auto resume period is how often an agent will try to resume monitoring after a database failure. The default is zero seconds, meaning that an agent will remain idle until told to resume manually. These properties specify the information needed to assign and release a virtual IP address as needed to always point to the master database. If the virtual IP property is blank, the other two properties are ignored. See the user's guide for more information on how to set and test your virtual IP settings. The next several properties are hooks for external scripts that Failover Manager will call if provided by the user. The comments and user's guide have complete information about each property. These properties represent a new feature that allows you to set up custom monitoring, for instance checking on hardware state and failing over when desired even if the database is still responsive. See the user's guide for more information. These properties can be used to replace sudo with a third-party privilege library if needed. The agent log directory can be set to a new location if desired. These log levels can generally be kept at the default values. The jgroups level can be raised if there's a problem with agents reaching each other during cluster startup. Otherwise, it should be left at the info level. The EFM log level can be raised if desired for more information about how Failover Manager is running. Finally, this property is a way to change the settings of the Java Virtual Machine running Failover Manager. The default value sets the limit for memory used by the running agent. Once these properties are set, they can be used almost identically on other nodes in the cluster. The bind address must be changed on other nodes, as well as the isWitness property for witness nodes. The virtual IP interface property may need to be different on different machines as well. We'll start our first agent to verify that the properties have been set properly. Use the EFM cluster status command to see that it is running and monitoring the local database. In the next video, we will show how to start multiple agents to form a failover manager cluster. This is the end of the installation and setup demonstration.